Uh, he's also uh, a teacher and coach in the Downey School District, somewhere in Orange County. And, wait, Orange County? Uh, I teach down in San Diego high school math, and so I'm also the program chair here, so I'm partly responsible for everybody speaking here in some way, shape, or form. So, yay! yay. Great. And um, so, uh, Robert also has been teaching for a little more than 10 years. And what else? He lives in Long Beach with his wife and beautiful little son. And uh, what else do I know about him? He loves long walks on the beach. And, uh, and you can tweet him right there at Matt Robert Kuklinski. By all means, if you love to tweet in Periscope, please do it through the whole Ignite expression. All these are being videotaped in the back with the lovely Annie Fetter behind the camera from the Math Forum. And these will all be posted on the Math Forum website in a few months. And so please enjoy those videos. You've probably seen lots of Ignite talks, which is why you're all here enjoying our show. And so here are Robert's two truths and a lie in the order he gave to us. So, number one, again, we're going to, at the end of his talk, you can exchange with him which is the truth and which is the lie, right, which is the lie and which are not the lies. So, uh, apparently Robert might have climbed Mount Fuji, he might have been on Wheel of Fortune, and he might skip a page of one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, because the animal scares him. And so, <laughs> on that note, we're going to give this to the fabulous Robert Winston. When my son was first ready to play with monkey bars, it wasn't easy for him to struggle. I wanted to let him figure it out on his own, but he was calling out for help. And other parents are looking at me like, why are you ignoring your child? I didn't know what to do. Now, the reality was, he was about six inches off the ground. <laughs> the humbella wasn't that big of a deal. He was struggling, and he was getting better each time. And soon he could fly across the monkey bars like it was no big deal. What I hadn't realized at that point was that there are different types of struggle. There's productive struggle and unproductive struggle. Productive struggle produces gains, and these gains help improve future performance. Unproductive struggle doesn't do that. It's sort of like struggle for the sake of struggle. One metaphor for thinking about this is with a bench presser and a spotter. A spotter's job is to give the bench presser the least amount of help so the bench presser can lift the weight. In that way, the bench presser gets stronger every time. But if the weight is so heavy that the bench presser can't even lift it, then they're not getting stronger, and that's unproductive struggle. So, in that way, un a productive struggle is better than unproductive struggle. Productive struggle has a cycle of struggle and feedback and struggle and feedback and it leads to reward. Unproductive struggle doesn't have it. It's sort of like flailing in the wind. You don't actually get better. So the question then is, what does this mean for education? Because if we're letting students productively struggle, but it appears like unproductive struggle to others, they might criticize their choices because they don't understand. In particular, there are three groups I'm concerned about. Students, others, including other teachers, administrators, and parents, and even yourself. If we can proactively deal with the messaging, it's gonna make our lives a lot easier. My colleague, Annette, who's awesome right there, she tells this story about uh, how she realized this was an issue with her students. It was about three weeks into the school year, and students had come up to her and asked her, when are you gonna start teaching us? And she said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, all you do is give us problems and you ask us questions. What are you gonna tell us what to do and have us take notes? <laughs> See, the reality is that students aren't necessarily used to this. This is gonna be something that we're gonna to need to kind of repeat repeatedly over time. We need to teach them how to learn. It's like the saying goes, we're not just giving them a fish, we're teaching them to fish. But they're not the only group that may have these concerns. Other teachers, administrators, and parents don't have the benefit of seeing what we're doing firsthand. They hear about it secondhand. It sounds like this. My teacher doesn't care about me at all. She just lets me suffer. And when I ask her for help, she won't even tell me what to do. <laughs> the reality is, talk to the other teachers and administrators. Let them know your goals. Talk to the parents back to school night, at open house, or even in a letter on Monday. When they're clear about your goals, they're going to be on your side because they'll know that you have students' best interests in mind. But you may even doubt yourself. Think about a lesson you worked really hard on and you really wanted to go well, it just wasn't going the way you hoped. And somewhere in the middle of the lesson, you start wondering, why am I doing this way? Why don't I just play it safe and tell them what to do? The reality is, you know your goals. You want students to productively struggle because this is something that will help them in the long run. But even though this is a worthwhile goal, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy to attain. So. I want to conclude then by talking about how learning how to ride a bike is like math education. When you learn how to ride a bike, there's a cycle of, again, struggle and feedback, struggle and feedback. 
And then you learn how to ride a bike. It's a rewarding thing. So with that in mind, how do we actually teach children how to ride a bike? Well, one way we could do it is we could ride the bike for them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this might be useful at first, but how long before, you know, because they might want to say, but how long before it's silly for a child to watch a grown up ride the bike for them? And how long before it's silly for students to watch their teacher do the math for them at the front of the class? Another way is with training wheels. Training wheels provide a structure that enables a child to ride the bike, but oftentimes they're pushed like, with a false sense of skill. I know I've done this when I gave students procedures that they could use like a mindless math robot, but didn't really understand what they were doing. Have you ever seen one of these? This is a balance bike. Notice it has no pedals. The only way you can use it is by cruising along, and in that way you have this constant cycle of struggle and feedback. You learn very quickly. Do we always have opportunities like this in our math classroom? Because if you don't, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to fall. You're going to, the instruction you came to expect is no longer there, and you don't know what to do. Similarly, I've had situations where, you know, a, we all have this, where a student can do the problem procedurally, and then if the problem changes ever so slightly, it's like they've never seen this problem before. It's a very big thing. So here's my call to action. Give your students opportunities to productively struggle. Realize that this is not something that will be familiar to them. You're going to have to remind them over and over again. But one very strong word of advice, don't try this at home. I've been trying to give my wife opportunities to productively struggle. <laughs> Next up is uh, Julie Dixon and her lovely daughter, Alex.